so we're going to kick off with Tatiana Figueroa Ramirez. Um, so she was born on Sofrito infused island of Puerto Rico to a military family and raised amongst the hodgepodge culture of the United States. Tatiana spent much of her childhood balancing overlapping worlds that would join to become her own. It did not take long for Tatiana to recognize herself as Afro Boricua. Boricua, excuse me. She is a Vona Voices alumna. She's been published in Queen's Mob Tea, Queen's Mob's Tea House, The Ascentos Review, A Gypsy's Library, and Here Comes Everyone, among other publications. She currently performs, facilitates workshops, and hosts events in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Um, and she is the author of Coconut Curls y Café con Leche, and uh, she's an amazing poet, and she is also part of In Full Color, which is one of our sponsors tonight. So I'm gonna describe what Tatiana is wearing. <clears throat> so she has her hair pulled back. It's dark hair, it's pulled up in sort of a high bun. Uh, she's wearing glasses and a sleeveless, looks like silvery gray shirt that has a, like kind of a mock turtleneck. And yeah, so there we go. Uh, Tatiana, why don't you go ahead and unmute and kick us off. Thank you for that, Jen. Paradise, my home. She is wondrous, mystical, alluring. You see clear blue water and rainbow gems made of tropical fish. She is the fountain of youth. She is poised. You don't feel the push and pull of waves keeping her skirt shores a blend of turquoise and white. She is fluorescent bays, modern commodities, threaten genocide on organic enchantments that dress her. You see her sky blue locks and white cloud crowns. She is rainforest, rivers, mountains. You smell her morning dew, perfume, and salty breezes. She is strength, power, pride. She is admired and despised. Resort tycoons will never let you see her age. They will never let you see her sick. Diagnosis, industrialization, commercialization, colonization. What do you call her? We see her cloud coils turn gray. I'm sure you'll never see the cats, dogs, rats, and chickens run wild. We see concrete crack with wrinkles on her foliage. I bet you'll never see her tongue be cut into the shapes of Washington, Paxson, Katy Perry, and McDonald's. We see the bile flowing from our callejones. I know you'll never meet a lost child. We see she's sick. We see she's hurt. We see her. What do you call her? Paradise? Where her children must read between stars and stripes of a language they don't speak. Where her famed fort of armor and pastel Pueblo Antiguo share streets and shores with her notorious ghetto. Where teens are providers and parents wearing camo just to be seen. Irony the true enchanting pearl of the sea. Her portraits of La Garita del Diablo overlooking her son's Anthony Pate now paint chipped basketball court filled with her kids, the forgotten ones, whose names you'll never know. She starves to feed them. She cries floods in their name. She is now barren. What do you call her? Paradise? where neglected wooden homes to you give her character, but to us are shreds in her skirt from past hurricanes, she is paradise. You flock to her capital for piña coladas and to save passport fees, yet avoid her heart in the forest and her soul in small towns, beautiful even in death. We're reminded of her place as the last colony. She is drowning, living beneath the sea of oppression. She is an attraction, an encaged exhibit, a property, but she is still paradise. You see Amazons and cockatoos adorn her neck with feathers. She is paradise to us, our home. We see vultures strangling her, her with claws. She is paradise to you, your escape, your toy. You see her as convenient. We see her struggling to survive. For us, there is no escape. Our only escape is to leave our paradise. What do you call her? 
So um, that's the first of three poems. Thanks, I see the snaps. <laughs> um, that's the first of three poems that I'll be doing. Um, that was called Paradise. And I'm, as Jen so wonderfully um, said, I was born in Puerto Rico and that's where I'm from. And that poem was written in response to Puerto Rico's situation as a colony of the US. Um, we're gonna switch gears now um, to my latest baby, Vespojo. Um, it's a chapbook. Shout out to Flower Song Press. Um, so I'm gonna read just one poem from there, then I'll hop back over to Coconut Curls y Café con Leche. Black boy. He was a black boy from the South, Tennessee, a stint in Alabama, ignorance explained, bubble living I needed to burst my purpose. He wasn't a racist. He was a black boy raised by his black parents, living with his black grandparents, knowing his black aunts and uncles, playing with his black brothers and sisters. He was a black boy from the South, Confederate flag not representing rebellion to retain slavery, but Southern pride to those with Lannister lion locks and wintertime eyes. He was a black boy from the South, one out of every six to eight on the street looking like him and conservatives have the only say. Forget black women, ignore me. He told me, you're drama and I avoid drama. Drama in place of black, Blackness, my blackness, his own blackness. He was a black boy who hated being a black boy. So again, that was um, from This Boho, my latest uh, project. Uh, it's a chapbook published by Flower Song Press. So you can get that um, through flowersongpress.com or on my website, which I think Jen is sharing the links to. So don't worry about that. Um, so I'm going to hop back over to Coconut Curls y Café con Leche, my first baby, full-length book of poetry. It came out in August of last year, so almost a book, a year old. Um, and I'm going to do, to close off, one of my favorite poems to perform. Things my daughter must know. You are beautiful. Be your complexion a cluster of quartz, a cousin of liquid bronze, or pure ebony that flows into the garden of black gardenias kissing your skull. Each coily petal caresses your mind, your mind that must know you are beautiful. I'm sorry if you don't hear it enough. Know you were born into a world that thinks you too much, too smart, too bold, too revolutionary, a world too small to contain you. No governments exist that wish I did not have you. You, the daughter of an open sea blessed by Jemaja herself. You, the descendant of warriors. You, the child of your own pure being. You are beautiful. Know you are loved and deserve to be loved. You must know not everyone will love you. You will be called out of your name. You will be touched without your consent. Respect cannot be taught. You must know you don't deserve this. Know you are better than this. You will fight this. You are beautiful. My baby girl, my blood runs through you. From the way you may think too much down to the point in your toe, you are my child. Know I was strong, death and I acquainted. Tears preserve sanity, even in silence. I ran away into line breaks and metaphors. Escape if you must. You with the names Milka, Monserrate, Erminda, Evelyn, Mariana, spelling the smart words on your tongue, forming your fingers into fists in the air, pushing breath into laughter. Know those names were strong. They smile and survive through you. Know you are strong. I hope you don't have to be, but you must know you are strong. You woman molded in jungles, fire with the force of Ochung's rushing rivers. You a mother of tomorrow, resisting the restraints placed on you. You will move forward. Mija, but remember Calle Homboque, the concrete cradle where island nights rocked me to sleep with coquilla lullabies. Don't forget El Caribe, where your ancestors built you a home. 
You must know our homes. You must know your homes. You Boricua with bomba beats pulsing through your chest and salsa rhythms rolling off of your hips. You Caribeña with boleros breathing through your gaze and men again mixing into your scent. You a dream thought impossible. You must know you are Puerto Rican. You must know you are black. You must know you are loved. You must know you are strong. You must know you are smart. You must know you are fierce. You must know you are bold. You must know you are a revolution. My daughter, you must know you are beautiful. Thanks. That's all I got for y'all. <laughs> all right. That was amazing. Wado, thank you. Um, sorry, I can't get the light right in my apartment. <laughs> I have a giant wall of windows in here and the sun has decided to start shining in on where I am, so sorry. Um, so let's see here. So I, I wanna mention, I actually have a project that is coming out soon. Um, it is a book, it's called Disability Visibility. Alice Wong of Disability Visibility is the editor for it. Um, it's an anthology of pieces written by disabled and chronically ill people, and I am one of those people that's in the book. Uh, Pre-orders have started, so I just shared the link in the Zoom chat, and I'm trying to get all the links and things into the Facebook feed as well, so give me a second on that. Um, but yeah, go buy the book and support uh, disabled writers. So next up, we have Nexus. Um, Nexus is in the Burning Man community, was born and raised in the traditional territory of the Pamunkey and the Piscataway, part of which many of us now call Washington, D.C. His pronouns are he, him, his, and he is a black and he is black and Filipino American. Nexus is a queer cisgender man in several ethically, no <laughs> ethically non-monogamous relationships. He was raised Catholic and is currently spiritual but not religious. Creatively, he has a decade and a half of experience working on and off stage, dancing, singing, acting, and storytelling, as well as almost every production and tech hat you could wear. Um, so I know Nexus through the LGBTQ task force. Uh, and uh, once again, the task force is one of our sponsors for our Decolonize Beats event. Um, so I'm gonna describe uh, Nexus and then he can get going with his his performance. So Nexus is black and Filipino American. Um, he is in a black shirt and behind him is it looks like a bookcase and a stack of books and magazines and, and things like that. So <laughs> and now he's dancing. <laughs> All right so you're up Nexus. Thank you. Um... This is a new story I haven't told before, so I'm thrilled to share it here for the first time. <clears throat> Where are you from? I'm currently at Howard University. It is my freshman year in college, and it is the first time I'm really talking to people outside of my kind of like educational social bubble. Um, I went to a high school in BC uh, that I went to a grade school to beforehand, so like for eight years, the people I knew were just the people who I knew who I grew up with. And so I think this is probably the first time I remember hearing someone ask, where are you from? And I just say, from DC, thinking nothing of it. I am at Howard University for this um, tribute to historical black musicals. And it's nothing but an anthology of like some of the best songs and performance. And so I'm talking to a student usher, someone who's probably also a freshman like me, um, who's just, making conversation. And so I tell her, I'm from DC. And she just kind of looks at me and she's like, really? And I wasn't quite sure what to do. So I, I thought I'd just ask her, well, wh what do you mean? <laughs> and she says, well, you don't seem like you're from DC. And again, I'm, I'm kind of confused. I don't, I, I don't know what that means. And, and I, I continue to ask her, well, what do you mean? And she says, well, you, you just speak properly. <laughs> and it was the first time I ever came into conflict in terms of like the idea of, or the perception of what a DC resident or Washington resident or a, a black DC resident is versus like my own identity, right? And this was a question that would go on to 
have all sorts of interesting interactions come <laughs> of it. Another moment that sticks out, I, I find myself at number nine, this gay bar on P Street and making small talk. Um, and this gentleman who starts talking to me, again, at some point in the conversation just says, where are you from? And I say, from DC. And this time it wasn't even about what I sounded like, it was what I looked like. And it, I can't remember, but at some point he just asked, well, where are your parents from? And so I say, well, my dad's from Florida and my mom's from the Philippines. And whether or not he was like, oh, so your dad's black. And he was like, oh, the Philippines. He, he just says, well, you don't look Filipino. And again, I'm just like, I, I don't even know what that means. And all I can think is to say, well, well, my, my mom is Filipino. So I, I, th I, I, I think I look like my, my mom's son. And, and instead of like hearing that and realizing that the thing he said was something that I didn't know what to do with, he just says, no, 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 you don't look Filipino. Like I've, I've lived there for a couple of years. I know what they look like. And I just say, well, I'm pretty sure I know what they look like too, since I've been related to them my whole life. <laughs> and it was just another thing where like, I just realized there were some people and maybe there's just like an in indication of how sheltered my, my formative years were for better or for worse, but that were putting in me in boxes that I didn't consent to. And like, as I've grown over the past couple of decades since that freshman year in high school, because I am 39, um, part of me just wants to start having fun with it. When people start asking where you're from, I, I, I kind of want to know like, how can I really test you in terms of like what you mean? Like, you don't even realize the question you might actually be asking. Or sometimes like, if I'm not in the mood, I just preempt it with a, like, well, I'm from DC, but my dad moved here from Florida and my mom moved here from the Philippines. And that kind of like, like cuts them off at the <laughs> like, chase and just ends it. But like, do how far back do I go? If like, what you're asking from is where are my people from? How far back do I go until I can tell you, like, I actually don't know because my dad's side were enslaved people who ended up in Florida? Or how do I tell you my mom's side were colonized people by the Americans and in Spanish before that? Like how far back do I go to answer this question of where am I from to satisfy whatever, the th whatever it is you think you you're asking and, and all the things you don't realize you're asking? Obviously I've got some feels about this question. <laughs> and I think that's why I fell in love with storytelling so much because it, it gave me some kind of agency and ownership over the narrative that made sense for me. And it rejected the narrative that other people were clearly putting on me and will, will continue to put on me my whole life, right? But I think a moment where I really found some, some reconciliation with this, because I'm not going to lie, anytime like that question comes up, I am challenged between like how I relate to each of my identities and heritages and how much of that has to do with like a not so great relationship with a, my dad, but like a really awesome relationship with my mom or the fact that like when I say like I'm Filipino American, like I know the country I'm talking about. And when I say I'm black, like, how am I even supposed to unpack that when my dad hasn't even begun to have that conversation with me? So it's complicated, right? And I find myself at Creating Change, this conference that my organization organizes um, in January, January of 2019. And it kicks off with a pre-conference Racial Justice Institute. And I was really excited for this. I was excited to dig into this work. And I was particularly excited for the caucus spaces that they would have. They had a, a black caucus space, uh, an indigenous caucus space, a POC caucus space, um, and then a white people working group because they were like, y'all don't need a caucus, y'all have work to do, <laughs> so do it. Um, and by default, just in terms of like, again, my own relationship with identity, am I black enough or whatever, I just presume that I'm gonna go to the POC space until I hear one of the facilitators for the black caucus space. and. And the invitation he shared was one that allowed me to be the kind of black person I am for the first time. It, it was an invitation. He just said, there, there's no one way to be black. If black is a part of your experience and identity, whatever that means for you, this can be your space. And before I knew it, I find myself walking to that room, right? And it was like, no longer about where am I from, but like, where am I now? And so, I don't know, I think, as I get that question more and more, I don't think I'm gonna answer that question. Maybe I will, we'll see how I'm feeling. But I think at the end of the day, I'm gonna tell them like, that's not as interesting as me telling you like, where am I going? Thank you.
Ah, oh, Wado, that was great. I, I feel that as a mixed race native person, I think a lot of mixed race people feel that like, am I enough or am I too much? So I appreciate that. I appreciate your honesty and, and reading that for us. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm caught up on getting all the information in both the Facebook live stream and the Zoom chat. Um, <laughs> so there's plenty of links and bios for, for everybody going around now. Um, so I just wanna quickly mention another event that Crushing Colonialism has coming up. It's called um, the three R's, Realize, Recognize, and Reconciliation. Uh, so this is an event that we are not necessarily um, organizing, but we're sponsoring. And so it's a, a day-long institute on indigenous reproductive justice issues with indigenous women and two spirits from across the quote Americas. Um, this was also an event we had planned for April 25th that we've unfortunately had to reschedule for September 12th, but we're going to do a shorter virtual version on Saturday the 25th from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I just put the link for that in the Zoom chat and I'll get that on the Facebook live stream as well. And we would love to have you all with us for that. The LGBT Task Force is also a sponsor for that event. So next up, <clears throat> excuse me, we have Lillian Wolf. So Lillian is a co-founder of 68 Productions, a theater company for people of color an alumna of the Governor School of Arts. She made her off-Broadway debut with King Company while attending Jersey City Arts High School. Lillian has directed and performed in various productions throughout New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. She's a writer, a fight coordinator for stage and film, and has over a decade of experience with tight lacing and corsetry. Currently, she tours with In Full Color to share her published works. Um, so uh, next up is the description of Lillianne. So she has a sort of shorter length, excuse me, shoulder length brown hair. It's curly, she's wearing glasses. Um, looks like a blue shirt and looks like just a plain wall in the background. So there we go, Lillianne, you're up next. Hello, uh, my first piece is called I Forgive You. I forgive you. Yes, you. I forgive you for all the times you looked at me like I'm a foreigner, to the point where I couldn't tell if you were checking me out or hoping that I leave the country. I forgive you for all the times you spoke broken Spanish at me because you couldn't tell I know the English language better than you. I forgive your inability to pronounce my name. I forgive each of the lewd thoughts you had or spewed when you looked me up and down and saw exotic written on my breasts. I forgive the sombreros and the Cinco de Mayo parties you threw to be Mexican for a day. I forgive you for not deporting yourself in that 24 hour span. I forgive the times you thought or said wet back and illegal. No, really I do. Because SPIC is the new ICUP. I forgive that your automatic response to my almond-shaped eyes and high grades is Asian and not indigenous native, and all the times you've been amazed that I don't have dark brown skin, seven siblings, or an accent. I forgive your shock after learning that I don't want more kids after having my only child, or that I didn't marry for papers, or live off government handouts with all my aunts, uncles, and cousins in a two-bedroom apartment. I forgive your compliments on my eloquence and all the racist remarks you made when you thought that either I couldn't understand you or that I wasn't from south of the border. I forgive your jungle fever and your confusion when I explained that the Spanish are from Spain, but according to Zapotec mythology, I descended from jaguars. I forgive you for leaving this space tonight thinking you were open-minded, for hearing out voices that you've systemically silenced, but feeling like you aren't one of the people I'm addressing in this passage. I forgive you when you've told me I'm a minority despite that we outnumber you, and when you tell me to go back to a country I've only known as a baby, even though this one has stolen land from my people. I forgive that you took my father and broke, destroyed our family but can patiently explain it away as the law, as if this country was founded on a perfect system. 
But let's not forget where our legislation has previously failed its people. After all, women's suffrage came about in 1920. Only four years later were Native Americans granted citizenship. No, not their civil rights. That wasn't until 1968, just four years after the Jim Crow laws were finally terminated. Latino citizens couldn't even vote until a decade after the law said so. And Asian Americans and Alaskans and Native Americans and Hawaiians, because what good is a right if the materials aren't printed in your language, deliberately discriminating so you can't even register in the first place? So even if you want to leave in the past like it never happened, the reality is that there are people alive today that are older than some of these laws and have lived through the changes. Progress takes time. After all, same-sex marriage was only legalized in 2015, so I forgive you if you can't see past the present day into a future where no human being is illegal. I forgive you for believing that forgiveness means all is well and done and won't warrant more action on your behalf because you don't hold yourself personally responsible. I forgive it all. But forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a decision. And I may forgive you, but I do not pardon you. And there is a difference. All right, my second piece is called Dear Undocumented Girl. Dear Undocumented Girl, you walk around living your life. You're able to go to school. You're able to see your friends. You're able to volunteer for your community and maybe even work to help your family. One day, your world may turn upside down. Or perhaps you know already. There will be people who will want you dead. There will be cruel, hateful groups who will strip you of your humanity and liken you to an animal. A disease. You may lose everything at the drop of a hat. Your family may be dismantled right before your eyes, and it may seem as though your screaming voice is suppressed to silence in a sea of hateful words slung in your direction, even from those whom you thought you knew well. You may be confused or angry or hurt. Frustration is a given. You may feel like giving up. You may experience dark thoughts. You may feel like this will never end, like this is the rest of your life. And it might be. But the baddest thing you can do is keep living. Keep living freely and unapologetically. Keep taking those baby steps towards success, taking up hobbies, taking pictures, taking opportunities. Because the one day, it'll all be over. And whether this ends tomorrow or on your deathbed, you can say you fought to the end. I don't need to remind you life is short. You've been feeling stuck in time since you found out and it may feel like you can't move. You're in a delicate balance of brevity and eternity. But any move you make is progress. Any move is success. Any move is rebellion against the system that wants to see you gone simply for existing. So keep existing. Be powerful and resist. Keep doing good for the sake of doing good. Keep trusting and keep fighting because they want the opposite. Because if they can defeat you in your mind, they've already won. You know why you're here. Whether you came on your own or were brought over, you know you're here to win. You're here to prove against the odds. You're here to sing aloud and show the world that you are more. Take back your land. Conquer it. Don't let others tell you that you're not allowed to be here. Don't let invidious labels tear you down. And even if you're afraid, don't be. I'll be right here. I'll hold your hand. People love you. They'll protect you. We understand this is all too much to put on the shoulders of someone so young. You might grow weary or disillusioned. But we'll fight alongside you. Even for you if you can't. The most you have to do is keep going. The most you have to do is start again tomorrow. The most you have to do is live. Reach into this wellspring of triumph. For as, as I was once told, you are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Love your past, present, and future self.
Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, part of the reason Crushing Colonialism is an international group is because we recognize that regardless of what side of the borders or what part of the world you live in, if you are indigenous, you are indigenous and you are a relative. Um, you know, borders are white supremacist colonial constructs. So thank you, Lillianne, for, for reading those powerful pieces and sharing that um, with us. So before our next performer, I just want to do my obligatory ask for volunteers for Crushing Colonialism. We are a small organization and we can always use help with anything from graphic and web design to data entry or helping us with um, organizing events like this. So if you're interested in helping, you can email us at uh, crunchingcolonialism at gmail.com. I shared that in both the Zoom chat and the Facebook live feed. So next up, we have, I'm sorry y'all, I didn't get to print this, so I'm having to read it from my computer. <laughs> so next up, we have Chris Light. So Chris Light is a 30-year-old Black Indigenous person living in Brandon, Bradenton, Florida. They're a digital artist, a poet, and they make videos. They have decolonization on their mind for a long time, and they also do work teaching others. Um, so I'm going to start off here with a description. So Chris is um, has short black hair. Um, I can't tell what they're wearing, but it looks like a dark top. <laughs> and in the background, <laughs> in the background there, there's some some windows with light coming in, um, and they have headphones around their neck. All right, so Chris is going to show us a video. I'm going to give them a chance to talk about it before or after they show it. I just want to give a description of it. So it's a black and white video with six screens, two on top of each other. And the, they look similar to the, a strip of old school film. Um, Chris, could you mute your mic for now? Oh, sorry. Hold up. Okay, better, thank you. Um, so let me try this about the video again. So there, it's a black and white video with six screens, two on top of each other, and it looks to me kind of similar to a strip of old school film for those of us that are old enough to remember film cameras. Um, two of the bottom right boxes have a red outline around them, and there's a red X in the top left and middle right bra middle right boxes. The screens show Chris from the chest area up to their head. They are wearing a dark t-shirt and a silver necklace with short hair. While they're singing, they're also dancing a bit in the video. Um, oh, and this video is called COVID-19 Sanitation Song. And so I'm going to share this all on the Zoom chat and on the Facebook live feed. So Chris, do you want to start off talking a little bit about what inspired this, and then we can show the video. Uh, hey, can folks hear me? Awesome. Uh, so what inspired this video uh, was all the chaos that was going on uh, when the pandemic really hit us. Uh, and all the stories that I was hearing at the time from toilet paper being three hours to social distancing, uh, to the challenges that we are facing every day for those where social distancing isn't a reality. I know for me, like I live in a house with uh, four other people and it's a very small house. So being six feet apart all the time isn't a reality for me. Um, and also just culture is what inspired this. Uh, and this is knowing that this is how uh, my people have survived through pandemics. Uh, well, our people have survived through pandemics is through art, through music, through dance, and that's it. Yeah. Oh 
my apologies. I'm shuffling between lots of screens and, and open documents. So are you ready for the video, Chris? I am ready. Okay. I will go ahead and start that thing for you. Um, maybe I'm going to start it for you. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for watching this video of Cove 19, surviving Cove 19, uh, and watching me perform my sanitation song, reflecting the times that we're in. <clears throat> One of the things that I love about these times, what gives me hope and what gives me joy, is the art that comes out of them. Uh, the way that resilience shows up every day and how I have survived, you know, um, so I am joyful have a lot of gratitude for the times that are coming up ahead the writers the poets the plays uh, the memes um, just the complete culture shift and reality shock uh, and, and the revolutions um, <clears throat> that are happening and will continue to happen as our economy just crashes and so as everything just changes around us I realize that nothing is inevitable but, but change so but as a human I don't like to change because I'm like oh, oh, oh. but you know nothing nothing is permanent Sensation song. This is just the lyrics, y'all. So, sanitation, sanitation, oh yeah. Sanitation, sanitation. Sanitation, sanitation. Sanitation, sanitation. Sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands, 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 sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands. I gotta wash my hands. I must remember to wash my hands. Elbow bump instead of shake hands. Can't touch my face. Don't want no germs, cause I don't wanna spread Miss Rona. Oh, I don't wanna catch Miss Rona. Sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands, 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 sanitation, sanitation. Social distancing, it's hard to do. How the fuck do I measure six feet in front of me? I've been listening to the CDC, but they've been dismantled since 2018. 15 minutes, I used to wait for toilet paper. Now it's three now it's three hours just to wipe my behind. This is, and this is make America great again. Am I behind? Sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands. Sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. 
Wash my hands. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. Black gatherings are a thing of the past. Cause we can only bring ten people or less. Sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands, sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands, sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands, sanitation, sanitation. Wash my hands. Miss Rona has let people out of prison. Miss Rona has made us realize that our government is failing us right now. Miss Rona has also stopped ICE. Miss Rona has brought families together. Surviving COVID-19. Gotta wash my hands, y'all. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. Wash my hands. All right, excellent. Thank you, Chris. They, uh, Chris shared that video with me, I don't know, maybe last week. And it was amazing. And I, I see that it was, this video was not on full screen. I am so sorry, y'all. Um, if you, though, go up in the Zoom chat and also in the Facebook live feed um, in the description. And Good Lord. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> the Zoom webinar stuff is still new to me. We have all kinds of technical glitches. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, um, in the Zoom chat and on the Facebook Live where I put Chris's bio, there is also a link uh, for that video that we just showed. Um, so I, I apologize you didn't get to see the full video <laughs> during that. Um, we're also sharing uh, any PayPals and Patreons and upcoming events and merchandise and books that our performers have for sale. Um, all of that is also being put in the Zoom chat and the live Facebook feed. If you are able and feel compelled, please throw some money to our performers. You know, it's hard out here for a lot of us before the pandemic and now it's even harder. So many of us are freelance and have lost a lot of work, whether it's performing or doing speaking gigs or just trying to sell our books in, in a, in a economic, during a time of economic hardship. Um, so yes, please send money to Crushing Colonialism and all our performers. <laughs> so next up we have Summer Dawn Reyes. Summer Dawn Reyes is the founder and director of In Full Color an organization that empowers women of color through education and the arts. Info Colors received two commendations from the New Jersey State Assembly and the Jersey City Arts Council's Performing Arts Award. Summer is also the co-founder of 68 Productions and the winner of the Permanent Career Award in Literature from the Society of Arts and Letters, New Jersey, and the New Jersey Governor's Award in Arts Education. You also may, excuse me, you may also know her as an events coordinator, arts journalist, writer, and actress. So In Full Color, once again, is one of our sponsors today. And they have um, a couple of events that I just want to give a plug for, do a little shout out. So they're hosting a bi-weekly Open Mic Anywhere event. It's on every other Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The next Open Mic Anywhere is this Friday the 17th. It's free to join, though donations are appreciated. Um, they're offering 10-minute sets and they accept all art forms, genders, and colors. Um, they're also launching a Skillshare and chat series on Instagram Live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time called Quarantine Cuties. Um, love that name. So the first, the first Quarantine Cutie will be on April 23rd with actress Daniela Rincon sharing a fun 15 minute at home workout. 
So Summer's description they're wearing, it looks like a dark green, maybe sweatshirt. Um, they have glasses, they have dark hair, their hair is down. And behind Summer is, looks like sort of a bright green painted wall with some shelves and, and knickknacks and things on it. So Summer, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you for having us. Um, and I'm also happy to appear alongside my in full color ladies, Lillian and Tatiana. Um, Lillian and I actually performed one of Tatiana's pieces um, in in full color 2018. So it's really nice to have it like full circle. Um, so I'm going to be sharing um, a monologue. It's kind of rough. Um, it's something I wrote recently. Uh, April is uh, many things. It's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, but it's also Child Abuse Awareness Month, so I wanted to um, write something that brings uh, some attention to that uh, from my own experience. So this is called Jars of Ice. When people met us at the same time, they'd always mix up our names. It's only natural, their meanings being so similar. And, and we'd say, well, April comes before summer like mother comes before daughter. At rare family gatherings, if someone always says, I look just like you, it's meant as a compliment. You know, dad's sister says, I have your curves. Dad says, I have your expressions, your voice, your smile. And I've passed this on to my son through pure exposure and strangers who don't realize we share no blood Tell me how he talks just like me. When I sing, they hear you. When I dance, they see you. When I pick up stray shavings of languages like a magnet, they remember you. You and I, mother, are inseparable. No matter how desperately I've tried to make us otherwise. Perhaps the strangest thing we share is a secret, a darkness, a gift that you, a pastor's child, it got you almost exiled. Our ancestors would call it brujeria. You called it pati pati, small faith. The way you knew when men would die was the way I could use Hello Kitty playing cards for divination. The way you talked to spirits in your youth was the way I understood the stars. This gift, which you denied because of your love for God and which I later denied too, was what pushed 12-year-old me to cast our names apart in a ritual meant to separate us forever. I wanted to be free of you. And it took 10 years, a decade more, of your abuse and a lot of Christian prayer and a lot of money and a lot of effort, but it finally worked. You beat me, so I sought freedom. You destroyed my childhood, so I sought freedom. You forced me to live with a man who tried to rape me, so I begged to be free. You destroyed my opportunities. You crushed my spirit. You threatened my friends and anyone you thought would take me away from you. When I realized you did not love me, that you only loved you, I freed myself. Well, I had help, but I carried the heaviest load. And because I was blessed with freedom, I am who I am today. I have a purpose, a career, deep friendships, a loving husband, a gifted son. And yet every single day, I am still impacted by your abuse. I, I am just learning to love. I am just learning to be loved. I am just unlearning everything you taught me. A year ago, I threw up at a lover's house and I expected to be yelled at, not cared for because I was sick. When I go out with my friends, I worry my husband will need a 
good enough reason for me meeting them. Because for me, having freedom to build relationships is kind of new. Recently, my son hid letters his teacher sent home. I wanted to, to yell, to, to punish, but then I, I realized, why would I teach my son rage instead of the real lesson he needed? Every day I work at separating myself from you. Jar of ice, jar of ice. So you can imagine how I feel when I am told that my name, my face, my body, my voice, my art looks like you. I don't talk much to your family, but sometimes they call. Usually they're asking me to give you money. Like you hadn't been living off my labor since I was a child or telling me it's time to forgive you. None of these people really know me or really care. But I always pick up, I think, because I am secretly dreading and hoping that it will be the call. Your mother is dead. Last week, Lola Ping called. And I picked up, and she was behind door number two. She wanted me to forgive you. Your mother's been so through so much. She, she was abused by her mother and brothers. Child abuse? I said sardonically. Wow, sounds awful. You have to understand her. She, you're a mother now, too. You understand. I looked over at my son in the living room staring into his phone, his feet up on the furniture, junk food wrappers all over the couch. He's 13. And he felt me looking at him and looked up. His curly hair, his freckled face. And he smiled with my smile. And I smiled with our smile. And I said, you're right, I am a mother now, and I understand. I understand exactly how easy it is to not abuse my son. How easy it is to love him. How easy it is to put him first. I will forgive her, but it'll be on my terms and it will be for me. Eventually, we hung up, and until the call, we are separated again. And that's it. <laughs> All right, that was excellent. That was so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, did you just write that, I think you said? Yeah, I just wrote it um, a, a few weeks ago, um, a little a little before the, all the quarantine stuff, but the first time I performed it was on March 6th, and this is the second time I'm doing it today. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. So next up, we have Dr. Maha Hilal. Uh, Dr. Hilal is the co-director of Justice for Muslims Collective, where she focuses on political education addressing institutionalized Islamophobia. Previously, she was the inaugural Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where she produced research and writing on the consequences of the war on terror on the Muslim community. Dr. Halal is also an organizer with Witness Against Torture and a council member of the School of the Americas Watch. She earned her doctorate in May 2014 from the Department of Justice, Law, and Society at American University in Washington, D.C. The title of her dissertation is Too Damn Muslim to be Trusted, The War on Terror and the Muslim American Response. She received her master's degree in counseling and her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
Um, I learned about Dr. Hilal from a fellow friend of ours and found out that not only is she a badass activist for Muslim rights, but she's also a really, really funny lady. Her comedy is hilarious. So you are up. Make us laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jen, and um, thank you to all the performers before me. Um, I'm really, really inspired. So um, I'm apologizing first because my bio sounded pretty boring for someone who's a comedian, um, but I'll, I'll try to fix that perception in the next couple of minutes. Um, I should say that I've never done um, sit down comedy um, before and online. So I hope this works out. I'm literally sitting. Um, and so this is a different way of doing this kind of comedy. So my name is Maha, um, as I said, and as you can probably imagine, I get a lot of variations of that name. So I get Mihi, Maya, Maja, and I always tell people this, when I was in middle school, um, there was a kid who used to call me <laughs> It is very strange. And I still can't get over it because it's just so strange. And so there's those versions of my name and then there's this um, absent silence. So today I went to Big Lots and the lady said, how do you pronounce your name? And I told her, and then she just didn't repeat it and didn't say anything. And I was just like, well, then why did you ask? Like, you don't actually need to know my name. Like, I'm, you're never going to see me again. So, like, don't ask if you don't actually want to know and if you have no intention of repeating it. But at the same time, repeating it is also traumatic to me because it's also, it's always, like, the wrong name or some random pronunciation. I just learned that there's a quote from Dale Carnegie that, um, where he said, the sweetest sound in the world is the person's own name. And I, you know, that really resonates with me. But also, I'm wondering... Uh, how this quote came from Dale Carnegie, because it's not exactly the hardest name in the world to pronounce. So it probably just means Americans are really stupid and they really can't, I mean, like, <laughs> they can't pronounce anything. They don't understand when something's written um, in English, right? That you just pronounce it according to how it's written, unless you know otherwise, which usually they don't. So it's just like a whole waste of time. So along similar lines, um, and uh, Nexus spoke about this, where are you from? So I don't take this question seriously because I have no intention of answering this question. So when people are like, where are you from? And I, I know they wanna get to the bottom of it, I'll tell them I'm from Wisconsin. And they're like, no, where are you really from? I'm like, I'm from Madison. And then if they like insist, no, where are you actually really from? And I'm like, uh, a neighborhood on the west side. And I'm like, the more, <laughs> The more I can see your intention as wanting to know where I'm from, the, the less likely it is that I'm going to give you the answer you want to hear, okay? Another strategy I have is to tell them I'm from a country called Abudin, um, and that's fictional. It was from a show called, what was it, Tyrant on FX, um, where they were trying to portray some hybrid country of like Syria and Iraq. And the country was called Abudin. And interestingly enough, I've told this joke before when I asked the audience, has anyone ever heard of Abu Din? One woman, of course, a white woman, um, answered her hand and said yes. And I'm like, but how? Like, where? But how? Where did you find this country? <laughs> so it's like even, they, not only do Americans want to know geography, they don't even know when you're um, giving a country that actually doesn't exist. But at the same time, they'd probably be okay bombing it. So I guess that's all we need to know. So... <laughs> When we talk about where I'm from, like the corollary is often like, how do you speak English so well? Like, it's such a mystery, okay? And like, this is even while I'm speaking English, while they're looking at me speaking English, I'm saying English words and they're still confused. They're like, wow, you speak English so good. I'm like, well, first of all, better than you, because if you knew grammar, you'd say you, you speak English so well. And second of all, like I grew up here and you can clearly hear it. Although someone did tell me once I had a Muslim accent, but couldn't give me any examples. So I was like, okay, how about you go work on that for a little bit and then come back to me when your um, theory is a little bit more plausible. But people also tell my mom this too. Like, how do you speak English so well? Okay, or do you understand? So my mom, um, who has a PhD in mechanical engineering, will tell the person, um, I have a PhD, do you? And they're always like, no. And then one time, some guy came over to fix something in our house. 
and um, my mom was talking in English again. Like, it's never like we're switching to Arabic and the person, it's always like we're speaking in English at that time. So the guy gives, and she's asking the guy like questions, like intelligent questions about like whatever it is that's broken. And so he hands me a piece of paper and he's like, can you help your mom fill this out? And so I just started laughing. So I was like, my mom is speaking to you in English. Okay, and clearly she understands. So then my mom starts laughing. And then he says, what's so funny? And my mom's like, well, you know, I have a PhD. My other daughter has a PhD. My son-in-law has a PhD and this daughter is getting a PhD. Like literally the only two people in our family that don't have PhDs are um, ages five and one. And, you know, we think that that's like reason. I mean, we're going to give them some <laughs> space and time to explore if that's a path they want to go down. And, you know, the point is not to be elitist. The point is to be like, if you're going to be ignorant and stupid, do some research and find out who, you, who it is that you're talking to. So um, I didn't actually answer the question where I'm from. So my family is from Egypt. Um, and uh, that has also led to a lot of stupid questions. So for example, um, you know, when I was little, people used to be like, do you walk like an Egyptian? And I'm like, that's the one thing you know about Egyptians, like the one thing you know about ancient Egyptians is that in pictures they walked like, you know, whatever that song that was that made it so popular. And it's like, have you seen me walk like an Egyptian? Like, did I ever come to school this way? Like, have you seen me at the grocery store this way? Like, when did this happen? Like, when did this happen? It's like, of course, I don't walk like an Egyptian because it's kind of inefficient. It might be good now that we have social distancing, you know, it could help out with the space, but... <laughs> It's really just not something that has really happened most of the time. But when we were little, um, we used to live in San Diego, my sister and I and my, my mom and dad. My dad used to take us to San Diego. Sorry, we lived in San Diego. He used to take us to Mexico um, for haircuts. And it was always really like unclear why that was. But we always came back looking like him with like really short hair. And it was like literally everyone would be like, why are you going to Mexico? And we're like, oh, we're just getting like these ugly haircuts um, so we can look like our dad. And we're not actually sure why we have to make that trip to do that. But we never ask questions because, um, yeah, you don't ask these kind of questions in Arab families. So we're really like, you know, when you look back at your pictures and you're like, there was a point at which you looked cute. And then your parents like started taking over the style in ways that you, can, you didn't authorize and could, but couldn't stop. And it was those years that we got like the ugliest haircuts. Um, but when I've gone to Egypt, you know, Egypt is also a funny country. Um, you know, we often think about Egypt as a dictatorship, but um, actually now if you listen to the news and you don't know who's talking, it might be the US, it might be Egypt, you never know. Like pretty much the same thing is happening in both countries. But when you go to Egypt, um, well, first of all, like the men hit on you nonstop. And um, I'm sure some of you can relate if you've gone to certain countries where that tends to be a problem. So they hit on you nonstop. And um, the only way that I could think of preventing this was um, when one guy gave me his number, my plan was next time to give the other guy that asked me for my number, the other one's number, so they could call each other. <laughs> and then I wouldn't be anywhere in that equation. And they could just, <laughs> you know, they could be friends, whatever, and probably like expand their tactics on making people uncomfortable, but that's okay. But in case that doesn't make you um, like super excited about going to Egypt, you should know that Egypt um, has miraculously developed a preventative method for not contracting COVID, which is Egyptian lentils. So they now have said that Egyptian lentils can help prevent you from getting COVID, which is, you know, obviously very scientific. I mean, I mean, why did no one think of that before? But it's not the first time they've come up with like these miraculous cures because a few years ago, um, they also said that there's a special kind of like meatball that you can eat um, that will cure AIDS. Um, so <laughs> I'll be publishing a book soon um, called The Encyclopedia of Medical Non-Facts from the Middle East. And you'll be able to find some of these theories and other ones because it's just like, it just, you know, it's obviously it, you're not, it's not um, intuitive that you come up with these kind of cures, but here we are. Here we are. 
But sometimes, as I said, right, Egypt is kind of like the US and vice versa, even though um, Egypt has uh, the reputation of being a dictatorship. Um, but here we are stuck with COVID and, and the US. Um, and, you know, if you've been watching TV, a lot of the press conferences of various uh, mayors, governors, et cetera, will say like, we're all, we're all in it together. And I'm like, no, actually we're not. Um, the only reason you want us to be in it together is because uh, you think that we might make you die. It's not because you actually think we're in this together. And then it's funny because like the, the hashtag that I often see on TV is like alone together. And I'm like, that's how I felt about the US before COVID. So it's really like, it's not really a shift. I'm like, I'm in quarantine, but also like part of this is usual in the US. It's not a big deal, right? But when it comes to Trump, um, you know, I think like every day what happens with him is that they give him like a word bank at, with options as to who to blame for the problem. So, you know, like yesterday was like a governor today, yesterday was also like the, the World Health Organization. So there's always someone else to blame, right? Um, and that's really a, a skill that we should all learn. When you wake up in the morning, think of all the things you've done wrong and then think about all the people and organizations that you can blame for that. Uh, because it's very effective, as you can see, it's very effective, like it's so effective. Um, I was taking a walk in this city where I am right now with my sister. It's a very small city. And I was passing um, one of these stores and the store had a sign for apparently what's Trump's uh, slogan for this year's election, which is keep America great. And I found it very fascinating because here I was taking a walk with um, a mask and gloves on. And <laughs> And then I pass by Keep America Great. I'm like, is this, is this really your vision of Keeping America Great? Like that people now have to wear gloves and masks all the time and that we've surpassed uh, the number of cases in every other country of the world and the most deaths in every country of the world. That's great. So I took a selfie, you know, so I could send it to their campaign to be sure that everyone know what uh, Making America Great has looked like and continues to look like. But if you saw him today or yesterday, he also said that, um, you know, we need to open the country because we'll be just like the comeback kids. And I'm like, okay, if we come back too early, we'll be the comeback to death kids. But I don't think, I don't think he cares. So whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but in case you, you didn't doubt that we're all in this together, there's an island uh, called Fisher Island, which is off the coast of Miami, um, in which if you've seen, they got 800 antibody tests uh, for their whole entire community because they're the richest zip code in the United States. So um, to me, when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, we're, I mean, we're definitely all in this together. Like, obviously, they're just taking the test first to see if it works for other people. Like, they're going to bear the harm. It's not because, like, you know, they have privilege or anything. They just want to make sure it's okay for the average folks to test out. And then, you know, they'll, they'll obviously pay for all of us to get it, right? Okay, I'm gonna say one more thing because I know we're short on time. But um, you know, every time I do a comedy skit, I always like think about um, some of the weird things that white people do. So if you haven't heard recently, um, there's been a couple of people that are going into grocery stores and licking the groceries. Has anyone heard this? So they're licking it so that other people can't get it or if they do buy it, they'll end up sick. And I just think that's really weird. But it's also really weird that um, I think last year, some white person released bed bugs in a Walmart. And then I think a few days ago, um, this doctor in Kentucky, he attacked four girls and strangled one because they were violating social distancing rules. And I was just like, wow. So you didn't think like the attack part violated um, social distancing rules or like, you know, strangling one of them violated social distancing rules. Apparently if you're strangling people, it's okay. You don't contract COVID. But if you're walking three feet away, you could. So, you know, I always think about these things because unlike other groups that are angry and do weird things, you can mostly understand the connection, what's kind of the source of the anger. But with white people, you're just like, when they release bed bugs, it's like, are you mad that people have nice beds? And the, the groceries, it's like, are you mad people are eating too much? And with the doctor, it's like, well, I don't even know what's going on with the doctor. That's for a Lifetime movie. I'll let them parse that out. Um, so I think that's it because I, I know we need to move on. But thank you all for listening. And 
it was great to be here. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really funny and really informative. And I appreciate you doing stand up comedy while sitting down by yourself over a Zoom webinar. <laughs> oh, um, I absolutely appreciated the parts about people not pronouncing your name properly. My last name is Deer and Water. It's just like it sounds, just like it's spelled. But people just can't wrap their heads around the idea that somebody has a last name of deer and waters. So it gets spelled and pronounced in all kinds of ways and brings all kinds of interesting and offensive questions and comments. <laughs> so I can relate on that. Um, so we've got uh, just a few minutes that we can do some Q&A. If any of our audience members have questions, you can just put them in the Zoom webinar chat or on Facebook. I haven't seen any just yet. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, how did you all, like what is your creative process? Like how do you decide the work that you're going to write or perform or create? What does that look like for you? And has the pandemic shifted your creative process in any way? And that's that's open to any of you who want to answer. Anyone? Bueller? Uh, <laughs> for me, I I'd have to say. Uh, oh, uh, would you just? Uh, this is Lillianne Wolf speaking right now. Yeah. Sorry. Please say your names before you speak. Okay. Go ahead, Lillianne. Uh, yeah. Lillian Wolf speaking. Um, I just wanted to say that for me, the, the pandemic itself hasn't really, uh, I don't know, inspired much creativity in me, but uh, I do tend to have a tendency to write about um, whatever kind of pops into things I've dreamed or, or experiences I've had uh, for my piece, um, I Forgive You. I've literally had everybody, every, I've, I've I don't directly address anybody, but I've had each of those comments that I forgive somebody for um, directed to me. So they're not things I made up. They're literally things I've experienced and I just compiled them into that, into that monologue. Um, but in general, like uh, I had a dream uh, for, for a dear undocumented girl about talking to myself as a child and um, what I wanted to say so I feel like th things like that sort of are what uh, help me or inspire me to write. Uh, would anyone else like to answer that question? Yeah, I think, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this is Tatiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Tatiana speaking. Um, so for me, I like to look at my poetry kind of like a soup or a caldo or something that needs to marinate for a while. Um, so a thought will come to my mind, whether it's just a random thought that I have, a dream similar to Lillianne, or, um, you know, something that I see, something that I hear, something that I experience, and then I kind of let that thought develop and let it kind of go through my mind, and then I think it through over, and then I'll actually go down and, and write it down. Um, and then from there, I'll probably just let the draft breathe a little bit before I go back and edit. Um, and then to answer your question about the pandemic, I haven't written about the pandemic at all, um, but I've been writing a lot. <laughs> so I've been focusing on a project that I was already working on and um, April is National Poetry Month. So I am doing 30 for 30. So writing 30 poems for each 30 day of the month. Uh, and so far, I'm doing good. <laughs> I haven't missed any days so far. So pray for me, y'all. <laughs> uh, this is Chris Light. I have definitely missed a couple days for the 3030. Um, but it is National Poetry Month. So I've been writing for me, my creative process uh, has changed. Um, where I would like usually go somewhere and sit down and write because I can't write at my the current house that I'm living in. I have to go somewhere else. I can't do that 
So I'm constantly bombarded with COVID-19. I'm constantly hearing people talk about COVID-19. I'm constantly hearing people talk about Corona. I'm constantly experiencing their fear, their anxiety, and their, uh, the uncertainty in this moment. Like I'm constantly interacting with the working class and the houseless. So like I'm, I'm in that and so when I'm constantly in it and I'm constantly hearing it, it like starts to have like a little ring in my head, like a little tune. And I'm like, doo, 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 COVID-19, doo, 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 COVID-19. So it's just, um, and that's how my brain is currently processing all the information in the daily news of Donald Trump or 45 and everything. It becomes truly a song in my head. Um, Sorry, this is Summer Reyes. Uh, so I, I feel like my creativity has definitely ramped up. Um, so I'm like working on a novel that I've been trying to work on since I was like 12. Um, similar to Lily, I'm just like, um, it was inspired by a dream, which is weird. And so it's like not, um, it's not about the pandemic, but it does happen in a universe where um, the pandemic, uh, in like eventually results in in demons emerging and um clashing with humans in a war but it's it's very complicated um but it is background so it's like really interesting to to kind of imagine what's the worst case scenario here um but uh i th i think you know it's it's been difficult because even though you now have time you may um, be starving for inspiration in some ways if you don't have constant contact with people or even just, you know, you're not, you're not as exposed to like natural human interaction or serendipity, everything, all the interactions you have are kind of deliberate now. So it's, it's interesting navigating that, like what's inspiring me about what's happening now that's really deliberate that I'm kind of inviting into my life or is that is coming in. And I was just going to say that um, usually how I um, prepare and perf uh, for performances is just to like watch the news, honestly, or like read the news um, and kind of like rethink uh, what I would like the news to look like. So for example, when I found out Boris Johnson had COVID, I was really excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then he got out of the hospital, so it was really disappointing. Um, so thinking about like, um, you know, how not only are, is the news and like the political situation so violent, but how do we um, sort of match the absurdity of the world with more absurdity? Because I think sometimes when you're trying to like just counteract it directly, it doesn't always work. Um, so, so for me, it's like very cathartic. And I think for Muslims, especially because my humor tends to be rooted in um, the political context as applied to Muslims, um, I think it it definitely is a different kind of release. And, and so I, I like to focus on like the things in our world that we can't always control. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I, as a journalist, my work has, as a journalist, the work has like increased twofold in some ways. Um, and I, and I often find it, you know, and I got to say pandemic or not being a journalist, I love it. I'm honored to get to do it, but it's a rough gig at times. <laughs> there are days where I'm like in my pajamas, hair all messy and like a bun with pens and pencils in it. And I'm sitting on the floor just crying because the world is horrible and how can I do this? And then the next minute I'm at my computer just like furiously clicking away, typing everything out. Um, but I feel like that was kind of the regular for me before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so we're almost out of time, but we did get a question from someone that I, I want to make sure that we ask. It's from Destiny Whitaker. She was actually our summer intern last summer. Um, she's an amazing Native and Black youth, does a lot of theater and writing and such. And so she's asking, when do you feel you found your voice in the arts? Oh, and please say your name before you start speaking. Um, this is Tatiana. Um, I think for me, I started to 
I started to, so I started writing when I was in middle school. So when I was about 11 years old or so. Um, and then when I got to high school, I started thinking more seriously about it and taking it more seriously. Um, but I don't think it was until college that I actually felt like I was coming into my own. Um, that's when I started performing. That's when I started putting together my manuscript. Um, around that time was when I did the, the Vona residency. So um, that's really where I started to take who I was as a person, but, and apply it to other people in the community who could benefit from my experiences and my perspectives and um, the, the lessons that I learned from that as a poet. Would anyone else like to answer that question before we say goodbye? Uh, hey, this is Chris Light. Um, Destiny, I found my voice around about, I would say I was definitely, I had graduated college and I was going through this, uh, I don't know what to call this, I was realizing that I was a human and that I was actually in my body. I call it like an awakening phase. Um, in, in my bio, what it was actually saying is like, I spent years decolonizing my mind while after I graduated, unlearning all the things that I've learned, um, including uh, what, I forget who said this, uh, the child abuse poem, including like what child abuse is and how it's replicated through my community and like uh, said it's like discipline or whatever. It's like, it's not a discipline, shit is abuse. Um, <clears throat> so around about that time, like 21, 22, I found myself, my whole body, and I found like I had a voice. Um, and it was like amazing to find that I had hands. Like I was just like, oh my God, I actually have hands and these are my hands and these are my fingerprints. And I'm like, oh shit, no one has fingerprints like me. <laughs> um, so I was excited about having a voice and fingerprints and being in a human body. I was ecstatic about that. But using my voice, that took me a whole nother 10 years of how to actually talk to people, how to get it, and how to actually express it in a way that drew people in. So it took me um, at least a good eight years to find my voice after school. Um, I would say for me, I've always like had a sense of humor. Um, but it was like, you know, one on one or in like groups. And so for me, it was like, how do I translate it into um, like on the sort of like stage performance? And so the first time I did it, I was like, wow, this is really great. Um, also, because um, it's, you know, my humor is very political. And again, it's like very cathartic. And I write about the same issues. So it's just like kind of translating um, the issues on which I write about into comedy which I also think makes um, more complicated issues and like political issues easier to digest so I think the first time I did it I, I think it reinforced um, that it is something that I, I like doing and something that I could be good at all right well we need to say good night um, I want to encourage all of our audience members to check out everyone's social media and uh, buy their books and merchandise and give to Patreons and all of that. I'm also including information again on Crushing Colonialism, our upcoming events, how you can get involved to volunteer. And if you also want one of these limited edition tote bags, there you go. Uh, email us at crushingcolonialism at, at gmail.com. Um, so tonight's performance will go up tomorrow on our new YouTube channel. I've included that link in Did both the um, Zoom chat and on the live feed now. And so I want to say wado, thank you to all of our wonderful performers, you all were amazing. Unfortunately, Nexus had to leave us early, but you all were incredible and you really brought some, some sparkles 
to my day mm -hmm. and uh, want to once again thank our sponsors diverse city fund lgbtq task force campaign for southern equality in full color and the arts administrators of color network we could not do this work without all of these amazing organizations and and the people who who run them um, so that's it thank you so much uh stay tuned for our event on april 25th 25th that we're sponsoring the three r's realize recognize and reconciliation all right, you all, thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Stay safe, take care of each other, and crush colonialism every day. <laughs>